This is the Polyformer. It's a machine that turns plastic bottles of PET into filament that you can use for your 3D printer. The building for this is actually pretty simple. You can go online to the Polyformer's website and they'll basically have a link for you to buy a kit which comes with all the electronics and screws you need as well as a GitHub link that takes you to a place to download all their STL files. The STL files can be printed anything from PET to PLA. You have those available. I chose to print mine to PLA because I'm only used to PLA. At this stage of building the polyformer, I have made the polyformer functional. It's not efficiently functional, but it is now functional. And the parts are all there and connected in the right ways. Was the process of assembling the polyformer easy? Not really. There were a lot of things I had to learn to basically just assemble this machine. The journey is still not over yet, there's still a lot of troubleshooting to do. But I wanted to take you through my journey of just assembling this as a complete amateur at 3D printing. There were two kits available for the Polyformer. One was a US site and one was an AliExpress site for internationals. I'm in Canada, so we can only really do the international one. Ordering from AliExpress has always been kind of hit or miss though, so it was kind of difficult to say when it would arrive. During this time of waiting, I decided to print out all the other parts. And the first thing that struck out to me was printing of this gear piece. This little piece was something I just printed. I didn't do any removal of supports or anything. I literally just printed this directly from the STL file. If I turn this here, it moves. I need to get better at 3D printing. This is amazing. It's a gear. Moving forward, there was a lot of other prints to print. For some parts that look a bit more fragile, I did decide to print them in PLA+. Plus. Not sure that's going to make a difference, but I decided to do that just because PLA+, Plus is supposed to be just a little bit stronger. Printing really had no trouble just because I have been using a Prusa and the Prusa doesn't really require too much to get working by itself. While printing, I've started to notice there were a lot of parts that were not the same as the GitHub instruction guide. Some parts felt like they were missing, some parts felt like they were very different than the PDF guide book on the GitHub. As you'll see, this does cause some issues in the future, but not to an extent that really would affect the build altogether. A lot of these are because of upgrades to the build, as the PDF guide is actually quite outdated. Luckily though, a lot of the things that are left out, you can kind of infer or speculate to how the design was improved from the old one. The only problem I had encountered when printing everything was a little bit of a misprinting error along the spool holder rings. I think my 3D printing enclosure might have been just a little bit too hot. I printed these last night and these things showed up. I don't know what happened here, but it's not as bad on PLA Plus with a black filament. If you're wondering why there are different colors towards some of these is because I was planning on using up all the filament I had left over. So all the filament I had left over were just a variety of different colors in green, brown, black, white, and red. After printing these parts, Jenny and I actually went to vacation in Japan and Korea, and we went there for about three weeks or so. I had planned it so that on the day back from our vacation, the parts would arrive. I forgot how expensive this one is, but it was in the range of 200 and 300. This should be everything I need to build the polyformer. And everything else has already been 3D printed because I assumed this would have arrived on the 8th. So it was supposed to arrive on April 8th, but as I mentioned in the video here, it actually came on the 24th. With that said, I wasn't really in a rush to get started on this project. My main concern here was I was hoping none of the parts would be broken. So we're gonna get started with the polyformer because all the parts are here. It's all the assembly that's left at this point. All right, the first thing we're gonna do is the electronics bracket sub assembly, which uh, is that piece there. Install with soldering iron. What? We stuck already? Yep, we were already stuck on day one after hearing about what's called a heat insert. Heat inserts were actually pretty simple, but as a newbie who never done this before, it was a little bit nerve wracking. This thing just came in. Time to learn a new aspect of 3D printing. 
it's actually not that bad. He only needs around two, two, five. So we're gonna do two, two, five. And then the temperature is high enough. This has to go in there. Okay, we're gonna go two, two, five, which that should be. Oh man, it's really not focusing, is it? Okay, you can just have to take my word for it. How to use soldering iron? Which base? Probably this one. Soak the sponge. And it's soaked. Right. You basically heat up the iron to a specific temperature as per your material that you're using and push the metal part in. Oh, that one is smooth like butter. So I guess on day two, we actually get started on assembling the polyformer. And the first step was just to put all the heat inserts in all of the pieces. After one or two, you become pretty good at this. We just kind of kept following the guide and put the inserts whenever we needed it. The next part was the first time we would encounter version differences which is gonna be a recurring theme throughout the entire assembly video. The first version difference we'll see is that there is a piece that is no longer on the PDF guide. Okay, two more pieces done. Sure, two pieces. It looks like two pieces are fused. This piece looks exactly like the one in the video, except this one is one piece for me. We'll plug in what we can, and then on the parts that we can't, we'll figure something out. There needs to be heat inserts on these three parts, because that makes sense too. And there needs to be a magnet, six millimeter by two millimeter, super glued into each of these areas. I don't have super glued, I just kind of have an Elmer glue, but I'm hoping that'll be enough. But it says as needed, so it should kind of stick in there by itself already a little bit, no? Let's see if this actually works. Is this gonna be the worst mistake we ever made? Only one way to find out. The glue isn't that important, but it does bring up a point though. There are certain things that are not included in the kits that you will need. I'd recommend finishing this video, see which tools you might need to buy. So as you're waiting for the kits to arrive, you can have all the tools already available. So here's another tip. The heat inserts will occasionally get stuck to the actual soldering iron. Using a separate piece of metal to push down the heat insert after the iron has pushed it in the right location is a great way to make sure you don't have to do this two or three times before you get it right. And making sure there's no heat damage to the area on the actual plastic. So the next part of this is building the first rotating bit and inserting the first gear into place. I would highly recommend having a hammer for this because otherwise it would be a very, very difficult feat. All right, let's see if maybe this helps. Gentle taps because I don't want to break the plastic. I mean, it went in with a little bit of hammering. It's like a fidget spinner now. And there's no way in hell it's coming out. Okay, I'm gonna skip ahead for some of these parts because the next little bit involves just following instructions on the guidebook. Although, like I said, the two pieces are now conjoined to one, you can still kind of follow the majority of the guide uh, word for word. If you want to follow the video, this one also works fine as well. It's nothing too complicated. It's just rehashing some of the things we were doing earlier. Okay, these two pieces I think are done. And despite the fact that they took some trouble, I think we're good. Next piece in, melt zone. We have two pieces for this. I lied, we have one piece for this. So the melt zone is pretty simple as well. You just kind of follow the instructions on the guidebook. A lot of these are just heat inserts. There is another tip to mention over here. The fan has directionality. There is a particular way it's supposed to point. So there is a right way up. A lot of people in Discord got that part confused. This is the only fan that's there. Don't know which way it's supposed to go on. Install melt zone wings before that one. The next little part is assembling the melt zone and it is very very straightforward. You can follow once again either the PDF for this one or the video. Both of them explain it relatively well. There are two tips however for this. First tip is do not install the nozzle yet because you have to drill that first. The second one is don't use the PDF guide for the volcano piece installation. It is much easier to follow the video for it. You will have to very carefully install this area as well because the nozzle and the volcano piece are both going to be under a lot of strain from the protrusion. I skip ahead here just because the next few pieces are very self-explanatory. Okay, another piece done. This piece with a little bit of confusion is now done. This piece makes me so nervous because that looks so fragile. In the gearbox, there's a very fragile piece. It is meant to kind of hold onto the thermistor as according to the video. The only thing is that is an old version. Do not attach the thermistor to that piece. It is not going to help. After the gearbox, what we found out was that the spool holder in itself was also printed now as two pieces as opposed to the previous three. 
uh, the pieces are just fused together for better printing, I suppose. And with that last tidbit, we are done with all the heat inserts and all the individual parts. Now it's just about assembling the different pieces with each other onto the main polyformer body. We need to glue two washers that came with this. We're going to start this off by doing the poly cutter. A few things to note, the latest version of the poly cutter is the poly cutter light. The final assembly of the poly cutter requires a little bit of sanding, so buy sandpaper at a time all the way up to 600 grit. The sanding is mainly for the bearings, which are going to act as the blade to cut the water bottle. There's nothing on the guides, but there are videos for how to assemble them. I recommend from 220 grit, which I have here, just 220 grit, to 600 grit. I do not have 600 grit. I do have 600 grit. So we have two bearings here, or rather we have tons of bearings here, but we only need two. And these two are eventually going to go on here. I assume they're the only bearings, because the only other bearings that came in here are these, and these are humongous. And he recommends sanding them for 10 minutes or so. This is sanding, so like, in theory, I can't screw this up if I do it less. I can only screw it if I do it more. Let's do it for 2 minutes and 30 seconds each. I think the mechanism behind this is the lower one and the upper one are kind of against each other. So that means the smooth ends of both of them should be touching. So I'm going to put the sanded part facing upwards on the bottom one. And I'll do that. It always makes me so nervous when I'm putting screws in PLA because I'm like, what if something cracks? And that means for the other screw, I'm going to put the side that was sanded facing downwards. <sighs> Ta-da! For the next part, just follow the video instructions. It should be very, very simple and straightforward. Try not to tighten the screw at the end of the rod too hard. You don't need it to tighten all the way for the poly cutter to work. And I don't want to push this anymore because I feel like this is going to break. Where's my caliper? I found my caliper. The caliper I'm using here is an optician's caliper. It's meant for testing lens thickness and it was not good. I would strongly recommend getting a digital caliper. Mr. Wright in there mentioned something about a conversion table to see how thick you should be cutting things. We don't have the table online, but luckily we have two things here that could help us. First thing is this thing here. And if I measure this just right, it should say somewhere around 16 as the thickness of these drills, which also came with the uh, the package there. Assuming the hole eventually is going to end up as 1.6 millimeters, that is basically uh, the diameter of the circle. If we know the diameter, we also know the radius. The area of a circle is pi r squared. So we have pi times 0.8 millimeters squared equals the area. We need to know the thickness of the uh, water bottle that we're dealing with as well. Let's cut this up here. Over here, this says around 0 0.1 millimeters. So basically these two have to equal exactly the same. So if I do 0 0.1 times 10 to the minus 3, so that will be 20 millimeters. Since you couldn't do 20 millimeters, I brute forced this with 10 millimeters. The lowest one is 10 millimeters and the top one is 5. So just a quick tip bit here, try not to do this with 0 0.1 millimeter thickness bottles. It doesn't work. There's a reason why the poly cutter doesn't go to 20 millimeters and that's because if the thickness is 0 0.1 millimeters, the width is very wide and that makes it very difficult to fit into the nozzle. nice roll. Yeah, this is like 8 millimeters. To start, it's like the whole 10 millimeters. So it's definitely changing somewhere down the line. That's pretty cool. That's one water bottle completely shaved to the core. Not very well though, so maybe I'll just keep this around as string for Aslan to play around with. Alright, polyformer start. After finishing with the poly cutter, we move on to the polyformer body. He's got two heat inserts here. We have around six holes. So I'm guessing we actually need to do the full six here. As mentioned before, there's always tons of upgrades and updates. So here we are handling another upgraded part that we don't have a guide for. Make sure this goes into place, that's all. The only other screw I have that's larger than the 12 millimeters ones are these ones. So these have to be it. There's literally no other screws around here. Wait, I can just check for this. This is like four millimeters in, right? So if this goes in further than four millimeters, it's the wrong screw. No, this can go in forever. Yeah, this 
this works and it looks right, so. I had hoped the guide would tell us which screw to put into the center there, but I did not find the answer anywhere. Luckily, this would be the only time when we have confusion regarding unspecified screws. So we have one less part because this part is printed together, whereas in his video, these were two separate parts. All of the screws used to secure PLA onto the metal rods are six millimeters. Well, that would have been nice to know, but I don't have it. So I'm gonna have to buy more stuff. So you're supposed to see a thread on the inside here, like this. Then this circular one is supposed to go over it. And then you're supposed to put the screw in there. Why didn't the screwdriver get included in the set? And the second thing is, why is there a heated insert here? This is never gonna see the light of day again after it goes in there, because there's no, oh no, there is a hole in the back there. Okay, so there is a hole in the back here, but I'm pretty sure that the hole in the bottom over here, there's supposed to be a screw that goes from this side into that screw and eventually hitting this part to lock it in place because otherwise why would there be a heat insert on this side? As you can see there's quite a lot of confusion here but I'm happy to report you don't really need to worry about this. Today I'm gonna have to order the screwdriver that didn't come with this one because I don't possess anything that's gonna go through here and tighten the screw at the end here. Although the previous part was incomplete it was far enough from the gearbox that I figured we could probably start on gearbox today. This is the thermistor. Okay, so the thermistor goes there. How does the thermistor stay in place? Because my reasoning is if the thermistor is to stay in place, there has to be something holding on to it. Is it a hex key? This is definitely not a heat insert. It is way too thin for it. It has to be a hex key. Huge tip of advice. Do not put the thermistor in the gearbox. The video is absolutely wrong. This is way too freaking difficult. Okay, announcement. I finally did it. The hex key is on the other side. That took a lot of effort here. All right, we gotta keep going. This is six millimeter screw. For me, when I put this on there directly, there's a little bit of give here. So what gives? Unless it's meant to hang on a little bit just by itself there. Basically all I did was I turned this over, I pulled the motor out a little bit, and then I put the screws in and I put the entire thing back on here. So you did say that you could save on some screws here if you wanted to. I don't see why not, and the main reason is because if I do screw up at some point and I need to take this apart, that's two less screws I don't have to worry about. I think we'll leave it around six screws. Because this is already very sturdy. The flat side, slightly indented side. And then this should go in here perfectly. I'm going to skip ahead here just because as of June 2023, this gearbox is now out of date. There is a new, much better Sun design that is out. Now we're going to skip ahead a little bit more just because the melt zone is very straightforward. And this goes on here. Well, this could be as tight as you want. It's a loose fit. I put that on. I think we're going to plug these things in. And then that might be the end for today, because I got work tomorrow. So far, it looks... It's starting to look like a polyformer, at least. So, I'm at work right now, and during lunch, I decided to look up some of the polyformer things, because things just weren't adding up. And I found out that Mr. Wright in here actually has a page on Prusa for printables. Somewhere down the line here, you have the step-by-step. -step. There is no thermistor here when in the video there clearly was a thermistor and i also went on discord and guess what discord tells me the thermistor doesn't actually go there the thermistor is meant for the volcano piece <sighs> i need to go back probably should have started off with the printables on prusa on prusa's website kind of followed all the steps unknowingly at least uh we paid for the supplier kit then we printed the remaining parts using pla this part is now fully attached to the area so you know that this wasn't a mistake so that was good so this Prusa page, they kind of had everything you needed. We have to disassemble it and bring it back to this stage, take the thermistor out, and then continue on from there. Just to reiterate, none of this really matters because there is an update to the gearbox. Okay. Back to where we started now. Let me get the drill. Let me just hold this in place. I mean, the entire thing fits through it now. I have no idea what a Raspberry Pi is. But there's only one piece of electronics that came with it, which is this one. This is not the same size. In fact, this is tiny. 
but I got this giant thing. So the printables from Prusa are more up-to-date than the PDF, but they aren't completely up-to-date. The new computer chip is intentionally much smaller, and the new battery pack is no longer a metal cage, it's meant to be a DC adapter. Aside from the DC adapter and the new smaller computer chip, everything else was still pretty much up-to-date, so I decided to continue on with the build here with the electronics. We basically just followed the instructions to make sure the electronics are plugged into the right spots. The outer motor here, I don't really know which way it's supposed to go, because it looks like it's the same on both sides, to be honest, but I'm guessing it doesn't really matter. I think what I should do is, I should ask this cord. <laughs> what I'm hoping is that this is meant for the power. So if this is meant for the power, we have this as an replacement, I don't have to do any of this. So the printables by Prusa is not to be completely trusted because Wright didn't actually write that himself. And he will tell you that it is recommended to flash the firmware before you add on all the electronics. So follow tip number 16, do the flashing before you add in all the electronics. Right him himself is actually on the Discord and he says that things are going okay, that laterality doesn't matter for that part. It's nice that he's active on Discord, but he did mention that he needs to update some of these things. And I agree, because like I said, we spent two hours doing something that's no longer necessary for the build. Okay, the day has come. We have to learn how to solder. So we have to get this switch on to that area somehow. And then there's a screen that has to go on there somehow as well. Everything else is connected except for the power. We have to find out where this goes to. Let's leave the cable for the Discord because nobody's gotten back to me that yet. And I have no idea what I'm doing on this side. I don't know why there's so many extra little things in here either, but I'm gonna guess they have a purpose somewhere. Wait a second, these are clamps. Okay, if I strip the wire and then put that part here and then attach this area here and then put a little solder on there, this clamp part, assuming it conducts electricity, can plug very easily into a pin and stay there. Which mean, has gotta be a reason why they gave us so many of these little things, right? Okay, let me quickly YouTube how to use clamps into wires. Okay, so straight out of YouTube University, these are crimps and these are called something else, but the kit actually came with a whole bunch of wires. Only this one kind of fits on that size. So this is the only one we can use really. This is a size that's exposed, which means it has to go in this way. And let's try to see if I can just, I'm gonna use that. We're gonna see if we can just do this. So this has to go in just a little bit, break this off of this thing. Perfect. And now we have to bring this in here a little bit. Do that. Well, I mean, it's kind of snug. This is all I can get because I don't really have a crimper. And now, according to schematics, we have the black wire having to go to the right one. So this one has to go on that side. Which means we're going to make this go through here. And let's just go through a quick check to see if this will actually fit in here still. Uh, I mean, it goes in, not very elegantly, but it goes in. <laughs> We'll just have to see if that works. Another quick tip here, the wire crimps do have laterality, so there is a right side up and a wrong side down. If you get it wrong, it will still kind of go into the little holder, but it won't stay there very well. If you did it right, there should be a snap. I did not put the crimps in the right direction over here, so they did not snap, and they ended up being very loose. Uh, they bend. In fact, they bend a lot. Uh, let me ask this cord. Okay, I have found my stupid mistake. On YouTube, I saw that everybody was kind of putting in with something like that looking at the edge corner there, but in fact, it was actually the other side. Because on the other side, there's a little chip that goes into there that kind of holds it in place. It just means I completely messed up this one. Instead of doing it this way, we're gonna do it this way. Because on the back here, there's like a little clip. And that little clip will actually hold on to the edge there. So I do it this way. Now it's really stuck in place. And that makes a lot more sense. And yeah, look at that. That is just so much better than what we had previously. That actually looks like it belongs there. Okay, that is done for that part. That means the rest of this has to go onto the actual switch. Now that is concerning because the switch in itself doesn't really have any more rods to kind of attach things to. Okay, 
So on one of the schematics, one of these is on ground and the other one is also on ground, which I think means you're supposed to put a wire through one of them to the other side. Now, we don't have any spare wires, but this is rather long. So since we're going to solder things on anyways, I figured I'd just cut a little piece of this. And since we just need that distance to go from here to here, I think that should be good. And now we have wires. I'll come back to this when I learn how to solder. This first one is just the ground. So according to the soldering tips online, I should make some kind of hook around here and just hook it to that area like so. And this kind of should stay in place. This is not turned on, it's just kind of a cold solder because I'm just practicing the motions. But basically I turned this on with the hot solder tip. We're gonna touch that area like this, and then we're just going to drip a little bit of this onto that so it stays in place. Touch, then dab. Touch, then dab. And hopefully I don't screw up anything. I think we're ready. Okay, time to turn on the solder. That means it's starting to slowly heat up. Can't tell how hot it is or if it's ready or not. Should I just try it? Like, if I do this? No, nothing's melting. So As you touch. see, we're struggling quite a little bit with getting the solder touch. to melt, and I think the main reason behind this is because the touch. soldering iron itself was not very clean. It was still full of plastic from the PLA heat inserts. With the dirty iron, eventually it will work, but it won't melt the solder very well. Over here, it kind of just melted into balls. Ball of thing fell off, but we got something on, so that's nice. Now it'll be real nice if we can get this uh, second part on there as well. Finally! And, oh no! It came off! Ugh. Okay, let's try the next side and then come back to that one. Looking at the footage now, it looks like we spent around two hours trying to get this done, but eventually you do get the gist of how soldering works. Well, one of them is on. <laughs> So I accidentally touched the solder to the white part here and it melted like water. When I left it on the black part, it did not do any of that. My tip is just very dirty and I didn't think about that factor at all because I'm not used to soldering anything. And just for good measure, let's just make sure this one is kind of settled down properly here as well. There you go, much better. Ground is touching ground, which is also touching ground, which is perfect. And now I'm going to turn this off before this line messes things up, and that should be fine. Uh, none of the wires are touching, so that's good. I need to figure out how to get this one into, uh, into a usable state. There's a pin on the inside of there, and this fits really well into it, which means I need a female clamp that fits into here. The only female I think that can attach to that is probably this. There is now a hole on the very end of that. Hopefully that'll hold. And we'll do the same thing for the top one here. And now for the final test. And I hope that it could. Oh. Yeah. And all of that is plugged in. Final steps. Flash the firmware and we are done. First thing I find out over here says it's a good idea to flash the firmware for Pi and MCU before you follow the part 4 video to install them on the machine. Too late. Let's ask Discord what a jumper is. So my current problem is when I plug in the USB here, that little part there in the middle should be lighting up, but it is not. I tried putting this piece on there because I thought this was the jumper. I'm, saying, I'm thinking this is the jumper just because this is the only one with metallic parts in it and it's supposed to create a closed circuit so I can plug that in but yeah it doesn't really do anything. So let me try to disconnect everything because this say maybe try this before you connected everything. We went on Discord and asked for help and after disconnecting everything it turns out it was the cable I was using. So I was using the USB-C cable that I got from, with my Pixel 7. I don't think that's what they needed. So I plugged in Jenny's old USB-C cable and this one works and the green light is lit up, so that's good. 
That got me worried for a second because Raiten himself said that if there's no light there, we're in trouble. But now it's working, so that's good. But now we know there's certain cables that doesn't work with this one. Uh, also, my assumption was right, this is actually um, the jumper. All right, now to do the flashing part. All right, so the next part is to do a whole bunch of software stuff. We're supposed to go to uh, Mac system report. Okay, system report. Okay, so I don't have STM th whatever in the uh, DFU mode, but I have something here that says in FS mode. So if it's FS mode, we need to do this, which means I need to play hold down the boot button, then press the RST button or power cycle while it is connected to your port. And we have a green light on there. And now we have to hold down boot. We're gonna hold down boot and then click STL. And there's a dull blue light. That works. And now on the bottom here, ho 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 ho, we're getting somewhere. It says DFU in FS mode. Wait, is that FS mode? As long as it says DFU mode somewhere, it seems like it's fine. So at the bottom of the page, there is a thing here that says installing the firmware, and there's a link on the first one over here. If you keep clicking through that link, eventually it'll take you to the website where you can actually download STM32 Cube Prog, which is available for Mac, PC, and Linux. I downloaded one for Mac, and this is what I got. And now the only problem is, uh, it's not opening anything. <laughs> Looks like we still have one more issue. We don't know why this application is not opening. So it wasn't opening, so what I did was I went here, and then I went open package contents, contents, Mac OS, then I clicked on this, and then it forced terminal to open. After terminal was open, it started working. And now we have this thing here, so. Let's see where this lands. I have read all of these, which I totally did. Okay, next. And done. Now we have an application called STM32 Programmer. That opens up. Hey, this is the display window we wanted. And now we're gonna follow this video and see if we can get that thing flashed. All right, we encountered a new problem. I'm gonna go over here and we're gonna go to USB. And this one is USB 1, that is saved there. And look what happens when I click connect. That's not good. So first things first, uh, from Discord, they told me to download the previous version to make it work. So I downloaded STM32 Q Programmer version 2.10.1. .1. So I'm gonna leave that on there. We got a green light. Hold down the boot and click the reset. Right there, blue light. Previously, the only problem was when this connected, every time I clicked connect, it just shut down completely. Hopefully this one won't do that. Go USB and connect. USB. Please work. It's connected. Okay, this icon over here, full chip erase. And this one we have on the uh, desktop already, which is just this one. So let's go over here, browse, open, start programming. File down, wait, was that it? It's disconnected, let's just, all right, time to reassemble all of that and then hopefully we're done. First things first, let's remove that little guy. So then let's just plug everything back in. Power, we're just gonna plug in now that's all done so yeah i'm fully expecting there to be a lot of troubleshooting here so let's just make sure everything's clear and clean because i know we're going to get very frustrated as soon as i start troubleshooting okay so as i was going through the final touches of everything i realized there's a few things that were out of place so first things first i have no idea what this piece is for where it's supposed to go on and i don't really see a place on here that it fits on so and this part i believe is supposed to go on the wheel here just by being kind of attached there and as it pulls along this would kind of rotate and pull the plastic along the initial bits so hopefully that will do that i feel like it's intuitive that there should be a heat insert right there with the screw through it to basically hold the plastic feed but i'm not entirely sure and i don't want to do a heat insert when it's not needed so let me ask the discord and also just you know, ask him in general terms, how's my build going to make sure I don't just plug everything and have 
everything short circuit on me. Oh, the other thing right now is there's supposed to be an interface where you can kind of control the temperature at which you heat up the nozzle. Don't know if the interface is gone since we now have a screen. I'm hoping that that's the case, but so let me ask Discord to see what they say. And Discord said it was okay and that we are good to go. All right, so this is the full assembly at this point. Um, I left the switch on here, even though this is not the intended spot, just because it fit too well. The screen is just kind of left on there right now. We're gonna have to find a spot for eventually. According to Discord, we now know that this is meant to be the new interface. A lot of Wrighton's older videos, you'll see that he pulls out an iPad. Now it's all completely replaced by this screen here. So that was another update in the Andromeda. This means this is all ready to go for uh, plugging in, which means we get to the most nerve-wracking part of this entire thing. I'm fully expecting this to have quite a lot of issues in terms of troubleshooting because it is a uh, well, a rather complex project. And like I said, we had to learn a lot of skills along the way, some of which are about to be tested right now. And most of which I've kind of just learned off of YouTube. So chances are there's gonna be a lot of troubleshooting. So we have the wires, so we're gonna plug that in. And let me just make sure we have all of this in camera here. We're gonna plug that in. My biggest fear is that the minute I plug this into an actual outlet that you're gonna hear sparks and then this part is gonna somehow break and then we have to buy a new circuit board. But I can plug this in now. It is plugged in. I hear a fan. What is the interface? Fan is working. You can probably hear that on audio. But nothing on the screen there, unfortunately. So I need to figure out what's going on there. Okay, when thinking about things to troubleshoot, the first thing to do is always to fix the most obvious. So I unplugged everything and replugged it in. Let's see if that did anything. Fan still working. Still no interface. I have made a blunder, a pretty big one at that. So over here, this is what the screen said. Now I thought that was looking at the screen on the back side, but this is on the front part because that's basically what we're supposed to see in terms of the interface. So I plugged mine in the opposite way. My black was on the left side and it's supposed to be on the right side. Following that, it should be the green, good, and then it should be a red, and then it should be a blue. So, was that all I needed? It is now in the right way, I believe. Plug. Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh, we did it! And the pin works! Look at that! My shoddy soldering skills worked! Oh my god! It works! I can control the fan! Oh man! Oh man, this is great! A quick start. It's rotating! The motor works! The motor works! It's moving by itself! It works! So as you can see, the polyformer here is basically all finished in terms of assembly, but there are still quite a lot to do here because I do have to make it look a lot better with some panels and also to put all of the wires in place. I also have to make the screen secured in place. The main reason why we haven't gotten to any of those other things is because although it's assembled and can kind of work, it doesn't work very well. To see this in action, wait for the next video where we troubleshoot literally everything. I thought I would just make a video based on the assembly because that already was a very, very long process. This was a very fun project, but I could not have done this without the help of Discord, so I will link them in the description below.